My breath came in short gasps. I tried to burrow into the ground and crawl inside my helmet at the same time. There was barely a squad from my rifle platoon spread out in groups of two or three, manning our small defensive perimeter. Heavily outnumbered and outgunned, we waited for the enemy to attack. It was only a matter of time. It was 1745 hours on the 9th of November, 1965, dusk. The rest of my battered unit, the 1st Battalion Airborne, 503rd Infantry, had been airlifted to our base at Benoit. The remnants of a nearly destroyed Viet Cong NVA regiment were scattered throughout the jungle surrounding us. There were only 14 of us securing what we were praying would be our extraction landing zone. Included in this small remnant was my company commander, Captain Walt Daniel, his two radio operators, Alpha Company's first sergeant, Bill Workman, myself, and nine riflemen. It was eerily quiet, except for occasional sniper fire. As I assessed our situation in the midst of War Zone D, it was getting dark and there were no helicopters in sight or sound. I didn't like our chances. Growing up, there were only two things I was hooked on, baseball and war novels. I was trance, entranced with the concept of honor, sacrifice, daring, courage, glory, patriotism, and military tradition that were extolled in the novels and movies that followed. On the other hand, I could not get enough of the New York Yankees, the Bronx Bombers, and the great names that wore the pinstripes, DiMaggio, Stengel, Mantle, Maris, Barra, Ford, and Rizzuto. Looking back, it was not hard to understand why I joined the Reserve Officers Training Corps at San Jose State University. I was hooked on war movies, and there was a war about to begin in Southeast Asia. Graduating in 1964, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant of infantry and soon found myself at Fort Benning, Georgia, learning the skills of an infantry officer. Probably the greatest sense of accomplishment that year was completing the airborne school with five jumps and joining the ranks of paratroopers who wore, the, who wore their jump wings with pride. Meanwhile, events in Southeast Asia were moving rapidly and sweeping me along with it. After completing my training at the infantry school, I was assigned to the 11th Air Assault Division. The 11th was the test unit for the air mobile concept as envisioned by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. In July 1965, the 11th was redesignated as the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile, and President Johnson ordered us to Vietnam. We spent 30 days at sea before landing at Quinh Nhan. Republic of Vietnam on September 16th. We had been told that we would be landing on a hot beach, which meant that the Viet Cong would be welcoming, welcoming us with more than just Hawaiian lays. Just like in World War II, we climbed down rope ladders to our landing craft. The landing craft circled, and then we moved towards the beach. Armed to the teeth and expecting to fight for every inch of the beach, we were met by General Westmoreland and the Army Band. My personal war novel had begun, but without any of the drama that I expected. But my day would come. 
A month later, I was assigned, reassigned to the 173rd Airborne Brigade, the first Army combat unit to arrive in Vietnam. The 173rd was an elite airborne unit that had trained all over Asia from its home base in Okinawa. After five months in Vietnam, it was well seasoned from numerous combat operations to include War Zone D, the Iron Triangle, and so forth. I was immediately assigned to the 1st Battalion of the 503rd that was commanded by Colonel John, Lieutenant Colonel John Tyler. And from there, from battalion headquarters, I was sent to Alpha Company, which was com com commanded by Captain Walter Daniel. Call sign Diesel, Diesel Stamp 6. And he assigned me to the as platoon leader to 3rd platoon. Four weeks later, we received our operations order for Operation Hump, a helicopter assault into War Zone D to seek out and destroy the 272nd Viet Cong Regiment. War Zone D was an enemy stronghold about 20 miles north of our base camp at Benoit. Operation Hump gained its name because it represented the halfway mark of the 12 month tour of duty for individuals. And thus the 173rd paratroopers were crossing over the hump to the downhill side of their tour of duty in Vietnam. 173rd landed on May 5th and Operation Hump started on November 5th. I'd like to touch briefly on the bat on the actual fighting that took place on Hill 65 in War Zone D on the 8th of November. And trust that if you that you would like to read more about this for my more about the specifics of the battle in my book. After two days of patrolling, Charlie Company, under the command of Captain Captain Henry Tucker was the first unit to make contact. And they soon found themselves fighting for survival against a significantly larger enemy force that was well equipped and bent on destroying Americans. Fortunately, Bravo Company was not initially engaged and under Captain Lowell Dittrich's skillful leadership provided the flexibility and maneuverability to deflect the enemy's superior numbers. His tactical, tactical acumen and superb skill in directing aviation assets turned the tide into a significant, turned the tide into a significant battlefield victory for the 1st Battalion. Ultimately, the 1st and the 503rd lost 49 paratroopers killed in action, 83 wounded. In the, at the same time, we inflicted more than 400 enemy KIAs and, and un, innumerable wounded on their part. Later, later estimates, later I should say, the first, the first division went into War Zone D, found documents which stated that there were more than 700 enemy dead from this battle in only one hospital. And they had two field hospitals at the, at the time. This was the first, this was actually the Army's first major battle of the Vietnam War. The Marines actually had the first one in August. Contrary to what the book by somebody else named Gallagher and, or Galloway and, and Moore wrote in, uh, what was the name of that book? My Soldiers. Oh, my so, no. We were soldiers. We were soldiers once. And Young. And Young, yeah. It was the next day after the evacuation, on the 9th of November, that, that the evacuation of our dead and wounded, Bravo Company, Charlie Company, the battalion headquarters, and most of Alpha Company, that I find myself, found myself burrowed on the ground, certain that our small band of brothers would be overwhelmed by a Viet Cong assault force before the helicopters arrived. 24th birthday was only four days away, and I had less than three months left of my tour. I was anxious, scared, 
and I could hear my heart pounding in my chest. My thoughts drifted to home and to my wife, Kathy, and our one-year-old daughter, Chrissy. It had been three months since we had said our goodbyes, and I could feel the odds diminishing on whether I would ever see them again. You know, my, you know, you know obviously, you know from my presence here today that the helicopters did arrive and get us back to our base camp at Benoit. While my worst fears were not realized, the events of that operation and a second tour of Vietnam prompted a long time struggle of, prompted a lifetime struggle, excuse me, with a condition that we all know as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Writing this book has been cathartic. Putting my memories and stories of those extraordinary young men with whom I served down on paper have helped me over these 55 years to deal with my depression, anxiety, and nightmares. The research that was involved and the nearly 40 interviews that contributed were terribly important to acknowledge the heroism and sacrifice of the young paratroopers who were in the battle especially the 49 who paid the ultimate sacrifice. The hump covers a great deal more than I have described here today. There's a wonderful story of one of our medics, Specialist, Lawrence, Specialist Fifth Class Lawrence Joel, mentioned in the Big and Rich song, who received the Medal of Honor from President Johnson. There were firsthand accounts of heroism by the paratroopers who lived them. And there's a search, you know, I guess a sad story of the true first major battle of the war was superseded by a book and a movie, in which I did not star. There are lessons learned from 55 years ago that we did not apply to the rest of that war, nor are we applying today, both militarily and politically. For example, fight to win use everything in our power to win, and do not piecemeal the use of troops into combat. What is in the hump is the soul of an idealistic young man who confronted the reality of war, the honor, courage, and sacrifice, personally fulfilled his duty with honor and pride while carrying with him the haunting memories of lost friends and soldiers who paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. I appreciate you guys attending today. Uh, obviously, my if you are interested in more details of the battle, my book's on Amazon. Um, Are there any questions I can answer? Uh, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, we appreciate the, the song as well and what Big and Rich has done to kind of bring awareness to that battle and those who have served. Um, if you touched on your writing was cathartic, um, having PTSD, can you talk more about that and how it might benefit other veterans to do the same? Okay, yeah, that, that's um, what I found is in 19, beginning about the 1970s, I started having flashbacks. Um, and the flashbacks just kept coming and coming. And this usually was one flashback. And I, I was trying to deal with it. And I found that if I wrote the flashback down on a piece of paper, it would go away. And then another flashback would come. So I wrote that down on a piece of paper and a third flashback would come. And this just kept continuing and continuing uh, over, the, over the years. And basically, 
I had all these notes and was able to then looking at the notes, I, I could, I, and oh, I should also go into, I was having the flashbacks. I was also going back to school to get a master's. And my professor, Larry Engelman, and he and I both, uh, I took the, the uh, Vietnam War class from him. He encouraged me to then take those flashbacks that I, <clears throat> excuse me, I had on paper and start and write a book. It was my actually it was my master's thesis that got extended, doubled in size to become a become the actual book. Um, unfortunately, Larry's not with us anymore either. He was gone. <laughs>